What's up? Time Talks Med here. In this video, we're going to talk about the sympathetic nervous system. As you see from this brief diagram, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic parts of our nervous system controls more or less all of our internal organs. Sympathetic being the fight or flight response, and parasympathetic being the rest and digest response. And they're both, as you see here, a part of our autonomic nervous system, which again is the motor division of our peripheral nervous system. So in this video, again, we're going to talk detailed about the sympathetic nervous system. And we're going to do that by first going through the general structures of the sympathetic or the autonomic nervous system in general. Just some basic concept that you need to know in order to understand the sympathetic nervous system, like the uh, different paravertebral and the prevertebral ganglia, pre and post synaptic neurons, which neurotransmitters are released and so on. Then we're going to cover the main highway for the sympathetic nervous system, which is the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain ganglia. And we're going to do that in two segments, by first covering the innervation of the head, neck and thorax, and then the innervation of the abdominal and the pelvic viscera. And then I will show you the relation between the different plexuses in our abdominal and thoracic cavity. This is to understand the relation between the ganglia, organs and the plexuses. So after you've watched this video and understood everything regarding the sympathetic nervous system, I'm going to test you with a little quiz. You're not escaping that one. It's just a simple quiz to check if you paid attention. Let's go ahead and begin with some terms. Now, the autonomic nervous system, so both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, is made up of a relay that includes two neurons. And when there's a group of nerve cell bodies that are next to each other within the actual central nervous system, the whole thing is called a nucleus, while a group of nerve cell bodies that are located outside of the central nervous system is called a ganglion. All right, that is the first thing I want you to understand. The second thing I want you to understand is that this is pons. All right, below it is the medulla. Then we got the spinal cord. When we talk about the sympathetic ganglia in general, we divide those into two groups based on their location. They can either be paravertebral ganglia, located laterally to the spinal cord, and we got some midline ganglia, located in front of the vertebrae and the aorta, called the prevertebral ganglia. The paravertebral ganglia run alongside the spinal cord, and they're interconnected, forming a sympathetic chain of ganglia, as you see here. And this chain receives nerve fibers from the thoracolumbar area of the spinal cord. Now, there are some sources that write C8 to L2, and some sources write T1 to L2. Take it with a grain of salt, but you're never wrong when you say thoracolumbar region. So, fibers may go up, they may go down, synapse with nuclei at the same level, or they may leave as the splanctic nerves and go synapse with the prevertebral ganglia. Alright, so this is the second thing I want you to understand. The third thing. Now, the third thing I want you to know about the autonomic nervous system is that you know they can innervate the eye, the salivary glands, the cardiovascular, respiratory system, gastrointestinal system, urinary system, and so on, right? If we group them all together and add the brain at the spinal cord here, the third thing I want you to know is actually something I said earlier, but the sympathetic nervous system originates from the thoracolumbar region, giving off preganglionic fibers to either paravertebral or prevertebral ganglia, to then give off postganglionic fibers towards the target organ. Parasympathetic nervous system has two components, a cranial part that consists of cranial nerves, primarily the oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. And it has a sacral part. Notice what's common for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. They both have pre- and post-ganglionic neurons. The pre-ganglionic and the post-ganglionic neurons release different neurotransmitters, and this is really, really important. The preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, and that's why the preganglionic neurons are called cholinergic neurons. So what happens is, is that acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors on the cell membrane of the postganglionic neuron. Now, nicotinic receptors, if you remember, they are ion channels that open when acetylcholine binds to them, and they allow positive ions like sodium and calcium to cross the cell membrane, activating the postganglionic neurons 
to initiate an action potential. Now, most postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic nervous system are called adrenergic neurons because they release adrenaline and noradrenaline, or catecholamines as they're called. Now, I'm saying most because there are some postganglionic neurons that release acetylcholine as well in the sympathetic nervous system to uh, sweat glands, for example. But postganglionic cholinergic neurons are primarily related to the parasympathetic nervous system, while postganglionic adrenergic neurons are primarily for the sympathetic nervous system, releasing catecholamines. Alright, so catecholamines activate the adrenergic receptors on the cells of the target organ. And there are two main groups of adrenergic receptors. We have alpha and beta receptors. So we have alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta 1, beta 2 and beta 3 adrenergic receptors, which are all G-coupled receptors. G proteins gets activated when catecholamines bind, which ultimately enables the cell to change. And that's how the sympathetic nervous system creates a change at a cellular level. I will try to cover their function as we go through the schemes for the sympathetic nervous system. So that was the third thing I wanted you to know. The fourth and last thing I want you to understand before we dive into the actual scheme is that if we take out a segment of the spinal cord within the thoracolumbar area, we will see that the preganglionic fibers come from the lateral horns of the thoracolumbar spinal cord segment. Preganglionic fibers here are denoted as dotted lines. These axons leave the spinal cord through the anterior nerve roots to reach the spinal nerve. Then they enter the white rami communicants to reach the sympathetic trunk. When the preganglionic fibers are within the sympathetic trunk, four things can happen. They can descend and synapse with a lower paravertebral ganglion. They can ascend and synapse with a higher paravertebral ganglion, which are usually the cervical parts. They can skip the sympathetic chain completely and go all the way towards the prevertebral ganglia. And once they pass through the sympathetic trunk, they may combine with fibers from other levels to form something called splanctic nerves. So it's the splanctic nerves that synapse on a prevertebral ganglion. So they can either go to prevertebral ganglia or directly towards the suprarenal gland. The fourth way is that they can synapse directly in the paravertebral ganglia at the same level. Now what happens is after synapsing inside the ganglion, Postganglionic fibers leave through the gray ramus communicans and they re-enter into the same anterior ramus which it initially traveled through to continue with the spinal nerves, innervating all structures related to the branches of the anterior and the posterior rami of the same spinal nerve. These fibers can also combine with fibers of other levels to form splanctic nerves as well, which then pass onto the thoracic viscera. And now same goes to the prevertebral ganglia. The postsynaptic fibers pass onto the abdomen and the pelvic viscera via a visceral motor nerve plexus. Alright, so that was the four major things I wanted you to keep in mind. The first thing being the difference between the word nuclei and ganglion. The second thing being where the parasympathetic and the sympathetic outflow is located and the difference between the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers is. The third thing being the anatomical relation between the sympathetic ganglia. They can either be paravertebral, as in sympathetic chain, or prevertebral ganglia, as in the cilia ganglia, the superior mesenteric ganglia, and so on. The fourth thing I want you to know is that prevertebral fibers can do four things once they enter the sympathetic chain. They can go up, they can go down, leave towards the prevertebral ganglia, or they may synapse with the cell bodies within the ganglia at the same level. Alright, finally, let us now make a scheme for the sympathetic nervous system. Just remember that this is just a scheme, nothing that is topographically correct. So this is just to make it easier for you to remember. And keep in mind that there are a lot of variations to these things. Two different sources may show you two different schemes. So I'll just try to show you the general one. Alright, now, let's cover the sympathetic trunk. Here again we see pons, medulla, the spinal cord. Laterally to the spinal cord we see the paravertebral ganglia, also called the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk. 
It receives its sympathetic fibers from the thoracolumbar area, that is T1 to L2. But again, take it with a grain of salt. Some sources also say uh, C8 to L2, L3 region. When fibers reach the sympathetic trunk, they may ascend and synapse with the nuclei located some segments above. They may descend, they may synapse with nuclei at the same level, or they may leave the sympathetic trunk as preganglionic fibers. The sympathetic trunk is divided into cervical ganglia, which are three pairs usually, thoracic ganglia, which are 10, 11, 12 pairs approximately, lumbar ganglia, which are four to five pairs, sacral ganglia, usually four pairs, and the last one are the coccygeal ganglia, and they're often fused together to form ganglion impar, which is the unpaired ganglia at the bottom. Now, let's talk about the sympathetic innervation of the head, neck, and thorax, most of which are innervated by the cervical ganglia. Now, the cervical ganglion receive fibers from approximately T1 to T4, and since it's not adjacent to the thoracolumbar outflow, they don't have any white rami communicants, only gray rami communicants. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Now, the cervical ganglia are divided into the superior cervical, which is the largest one of them, middle cervical ganglia, which is extremely small. It may be divided into two to three smaller parts, or sometimes it may be even absent. And we got the inferior cervical ganglia, which is often fused with the first thoracic ganglion, to which then is called the cervical thoracic ganglion, or the stellate ganglion. It's a headache sometimes studying the sympathetic nervous system. There are a whole lot of different variations. But let's start with the superior cervical first. The gray rami communicants of the superior cervical ganglion is going to continue into the rami of the first four cervical nerves, innervating structures associated with those nerves. But what's special here is that the superior ganglion is going to give off the postganglionic internal carotid nerve, which forms the internal carotid plexus around the internal carotid artery. From here, these postganglionic fibers will go through the optic ganglion without synapsing with it, then further towards the eye, releasing norepinephrine. Now, think about it logically. In a fight or flight response, what is the eye going to do in order to help in this situation? Well, you want to be able to see all options that you have in a fight or flight response, right? So the pupils are going to dilate. So norepinephrine is going to act on the dilator pupillae muscle, causing pupillary dilation, allowing more light to come in and give you the possibility to see far. The norepinephrine is also going to act on the ciliaris muscle to flatten the lens, allowing to focus on far vision as well. And this is called accommodation. So norepinephrine here also help with accommodation. All right, so what else do we have from the internal carotid plexus? We got a deep petrosal nerve, which carries sympathetic fibers into the pterygopalatine ganglion. And remember, those are postganglionic fibers, so they're not going to synapse in these ganglia. These postganglionic fibers come from the superior cervical ganglia. The deep petrosal nerve is going to act on two places. It's going to act on the blood vessels supplying the lacrimal gland, releasing norepinephrine, decreasing the blood flow to decrease the lacrimation or it can act directly on the lacrimal gland, decreasing the lacrimation, decreasing the tear production basically. Other places is that it can also act on glands located in the oral cavity, nasal cavity, and the sinuses, specifically the maxillary and the sphenoid sinus. It's going to do the same there. Norepinephrine causes vasoconstriction to decrease the blood flow to these areas, and it's also going to act on the salivary glands within the oral cavity to make a thick mucus production. So that is the branches associated with the internal carotid plexus. Now, since we have an internal carotid nerve, we gotta have an external carotid nerve as well, right? And this one is going to form a plexus around the external carotid artery. From here, we're going to have a sympathetic root going towards the submandibular ganglion and a sympathetic root going towards the otic ganglion, both providing sympathetic innervation to primarily major salivary glands which are the parotid, submandibular, and the sublingual glands, decreasing the mucus production there too. The superior cervical nerve also give off a laryngeal-pharyngeal nerve, which join the pharyngeal branches from the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, 
and form the pharyngeal plexus to basically provide motor, sensory, and sympathetic innervation to the pharyngeal area. Alright, let's do the middle cervical one. Remember, the middle cervical ganglion is extremely small and varies between the population. Now, after receiving its preganglionic fibers from the upper thoracic segments, it will give off gray rami communicants towards the fifth and sixth cervical nerves and supply structures associated with them. Now, there are going to be fibers from the middle cervical as well as from the inferior cervical ganglion that's going to go towards the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. Now, keep in mind, remember, these glands are under hormonal control from the pituitary gland, so the sympathetic nerves act as vasomotor nerves, not secretor motor, basically increasing blood flow to help produce more thyroid hormones for energy during the fight or flight response. From the inferior cervical ganglion, we got gray rami communicants that join the seventh cervical nerve and the first thoracic nerve. Again, there are variations, but the inferior cervical ganglion also give off a vertebral nerve that travel towards the vertebral artery and form a plexus around it. Other nerves we got here is a superior cervical cardiac nerve, a middle cervical cardiac nerve, and an inferior cervical cardiac nerve, which all go together towards the heart to help form the cardiac plexus. So that was everything for the cervical ganglia. Now, the thoracic ganglia all have gray rami communicants that join the intercostal nerves, but what they also have are fibers that contribute to the sympathetic innervation of the thoracic viscera. From approximately T2, T3, T4, and T5, we got thoracic cardiac nerves, which join in with the cardiac plexus to help with the sympathetic innervation. Now, if you remember from the anatomy of the heart, the heart has mainly two systems. It has a myocardial system and a conducting system. The sympathetic nerves are going to act on both of them. What do you think is going to happen now in a fight or flight response? Now, the conducting system is composed of nodal cells, right? The SA node is primarily the functional one. They function to regulate the heart rate. So what's going to happen is that the sympathetic nervous system is going to try to increase the heart rate. So it has a positive chronotropic action. And we said that the heart has two main systems, right? The other one being the myocardium. So you know you're in a fight or flight response, right? You need more blood to the body. And so you need the cardiac muscles to contract harder, to increase its cardiac output and again increase the blood pressure. So that's the other thing that's going to happen, is going to increase the contractility. We call that positive inotropic effect. All right, now let's add some more organs here. From around the same region, there are going to be postganglionic fibers that's going to give sympathetic supply to the esophagus and the bronchi, basically to help form the esophageal plexus and the pulmonary plexus. Now, you usually don't eat when you're fighting or running, usually, right? So you would want to decrease the peristalsis in the esophagus. That's basically what the sympathetic innervation here does. It decreases the peristalsis in the esophagus. The respiratory system is opposite. You need oxygen during fight or flight response. So it causes bronchodilation and vasoconstriction of the bronchial arteries to decrease the blood flow and decrease the secretion of glands to help open up the airways as much as possible. So that was mainly what I wanted to talk about when it comes to the innervation of the head, neck and thorax. Let's do the sympathetic innervation of the abdominal and the pelvic viscera. Now there are two main things here that I want you to remember. The first thing is that all nerves that exit and supply the organs are called splanchnic nerves. Remember, those are preganglionic fibers and they don't synapse with the paravertebral ganglia at all. What they do is that they exit and travel towards the pre-vertebral ganglia. This is so important that you understand this concept. Now, here we see a section of the abdominal aorta, along with some plexuses as well. The pre-vertebral ganglions that we have are the celiac ganglia, superior mesenteric ganglia, aorticorenal ganglion, and the inferior mesenteric ganglia. These ganglia have postganglionic fibers that travel through their plexuses to innervate specific organs. 
And again, I need to emphasize this before we continue. There are a whole lot of variations when it comes to the sympathetic outflow. Different sources may give you different information. And to be fair, they're all true. And the reason is that many of these ganglia are interconnected. But let's go through the very basic scheme. From approximately T5 to T9, we got preganglionic fibers called the greater splanctic nerves that carry their fibers to the celiac ganglia. After synapsing, the celiac ganglia give off postganglionic fibers that travel along the plexus on the arterial branches of the celiac trunk and they mainly provide sympathetic innervation to the upper organs here. So it goes to the liver to promote glycogenolysis. You know, we're in a fight or flight situation. We need sugar. So we're breaking down glycogen into glucose. Fibers will also go to the stomach and the upper part of the duodenum to inhibit peristalsis and also increase the contraction of the pyloric sphincter. We don't really need our GI tract to be active at this moment, so the bile pathway is also inhibited. The pancreas is also innervated here to basically help keep our blood sugar high. Uh, so it's going to increase the glucagon and decrease the insulin production. Fibers can also go to the spleen. Now, the spleen is ideally positioned within the circulatory system as a blood filter to detect, respond to, and protect against bloodborne antigens, right? So it's packed with blood and lymphocytes. Within the spleen, we got a non-lymphoid red pulp and a lymphoid white pulp. And in between them is a marginal zone, a transitional zone from circulation to peripheral lymphoid tissue. One important function of the marginal zone is to trap particles and initiate innate response against them, or to initiate immune tolerance. The sympathetic nerves here theoretically help regulate the immune activities within this system through norepinephrine. Now, I'm not sure to what extent this is completely relevant to the overall sympathetic response, but I will put my sources down in the description if you want to read a little bit more about it. Now, the greater splanctic nerve can have a branch that come off here and go to the renal medulla. What does that mean? That means that the adrenal medulla receives preganglionic fibers directly. And so these fibers go directly towards the chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla. We call these an intramural ganglia. And when the chromaffin cells are stimulated, it's going to release norepinephrine and epinephrine directly into the bloodstream to have a widespread strong effect on the whole body. From T10 and T11, we got the lesser splanctic nerve that primarily go to the superior mesenteric ganglion, which supplies things like the ascending colon, cecum, proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon, the small intestine, and the distal duodenum, all to inhibit the GI system. Again, decrease peristalsis, decrease absorption by constricting the blood vessels, and decreasing the secretion process. Then from T11, we got the least splanctic nerve, which may go to the aorticorenal ganglion. Again, there are a whole lot of variations. Fibers from the lesser splanctic nerve may go to the aorticorenal ganglion, and the least splanctic nerve may go directly to the renal plexus. Different sources might tell you different things, just keep those things in mind. But essentially what's important is that postganglionic fibers are going to innervate the kidneys. Now, what do you want the kidneys to do in a fight or flight response? You don't really want to pee. So you cause vasoconstriction of the blood flow to decrease the urine production within the kidney. And remember we got something called the ROS system, a renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system? Sympathetic response help produce more renin from the kidneys to help increase the blood pressure. Fibers also go to the ureter to decrease the peristalsis of the ureters. From the lumbar region, we got the lumbar splanctic nerves going towards the inferior mesenteric ganglion. The inferior mesenteric ganglion is the most inferior of the prevertebral sympathetic ganglia in the abdomen. It's actually a small ganglion, and sometimes it may just be a loose collection of cells rather than a definitive ganglion. So some sources don't even consider it as a ganglion. You may find some sources write that the preganglionic fibers synapse with cells within the plexuses of this region, whether that may be the inferior mesenteric plexus or the intermesenteric plexus. But the overall postganglionic supply is the same, and that is highlighted here. 
basically supplying the rest of the GI tract, which is the descending colon, sigmoid, uh, the distal transverse colon, and the rectum. Postganglionic fibers also go towards the smooth muscles within the walls of the urinary bladder. Do you want to urinate when you're in a fight or flight response? No. So it's going to decrease the contraction of the urinary bladder. And it's also going to increase the constriction of the internal urethral sphincter to help keep the urine in. Then we got the genitals. So ovaries, uterus and so on for the female. And for the male is the penis, scrotum and so on. In male, the sympathetic response is going to primarily help with ejaculation. For female, it will act on the uterus to primarily cause uterine contractions, not to go into too much detail. Lastly, we have the sacral splanctic nerve, which may contribute to the innervation of organs around the inferior hypogastric plexus, mainly the gonads. Remember, I keep telling you this, that there are a whole lot of variations when it comes to this system, and different ganglia and fibers are interconnected between each other. So the last thing I want to mention here is something I haven't mentioned here, but you see all those nerves in between the ganglia? Those are all the plexuses in the abdominal region that contain autonomic nerves in general. So both sympathetic nerves and also parasympathetic fibers through the vagus nerve and the pelvic splanctic nerves. So for example, the celiac ganglia, how does the fibers here reach its target organs? Through the celiac plexus which may be connected to the superior mesenteric ganglia as well. There is the superior mesenteric plexus, the inferior mesenteric plexus. In the pelvis, we have something called the superior hypogastric plexus. And the inferior hypogastric plexus, we got the intermesenteric plexus as well. They all contain cell bodies that act as postganglionic fibers. And when these cell bodies are clustered, that is when we get those prevertebral ganglia. And remember, I told you that the inferior mesenteric ganglion is sometimes scattered so much that it's not even considered a ganglia. So some sources might write that a fibrous synapse with cells within the inferior mesenteric plexus, for example. But overall, this is how the plexuses are arranged within the abdominal and the pelvic cavity. In the thorax, you know, you may have the pulmonary plexus, the cardiac plexus, and also the esophageal plexus. There are some other plexuses here as well, but overall, that was mainly all I had for the sympathetic nervous system. I hope that made sense. Now comes the fun part. Remember I told you we got some important preganglionic nerves coming from the thoracic, lumbar, and sacral regions going towards the prevertebral ganglia? What's the name of those preganglionic fibers? Awesome, 10 points if you got that one correct. What about here? What's the four main branches that is given off from the superior cervical ganglion? And I will reveal the answer now. Got those correct as well? In that case, you've grasped the most important things that you need to know when it comes to the anatomy of the sympathetic outflow. The next video is going to be about the parasympathetic nervous system. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. If you enjoyed, learned something from it, please remember to like, comment your favorite moment, subscribe, turn on those notifications. If you're looking for other ways to support, go ahead and check out the link in the description box. Have fun y'all. Peace.